Church said, Father, we thank you for the Bible study tonight. Thank you for everything we have learned already. We pray, Lord, that all these things will be reaching on the table of every heart. And Lord, the passion, the fire, the fervency, the pursuit, you grant to every one of us in Jesus' name. We pray that any passion we have lost, any fire we have lost, any commitment we have lost, you restore to everyone abundantly in Jesus' name. Open the pages of the scriptures to everyone, even tonight. And we pray that the grace to abide in the word, to live like the word teaches us, and to move on in everything, every action, according to your word, your grant to every one of us in Jesus' name. Members, ministers, parents, children, long-time believers, and newcomers, we pray, we'll follow your word step by step, day after day, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. You must give me another amen before you sit down. God bless you. We're coming to Galatians chapter 2. And today we're looking at verses 11, 12, 13, and 14. Galatians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. And then in verse 12, it says, For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision then in verse 13 and the other Jews dissembled likewise with him in so much that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation now in verse 14 but when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel I said unto Peter, before them all, if thou being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We thank the Lord for the passage of scripture we're looking at today. It's one of the evidences that the Bible is the Word of God. Normally when you write the story, the history of great men, and you write their autobiography, you do not put some of these things there that might bring them to bad light. Why should there be any disagreement between Barnabas and Paul that's written the Bible? Why should there be any kind of dissembling or dissimulation in the action of Peter that's written in the Bible? How should Paul confront Peter because of what he has done that's written in the Bible? And we need to remember that whatsoever things were written at all time. They were reaching forward learning that we through the comfort and the patience of scriptures might have hope. So today we're looking at preserving the truth of the gospel at all costs. Preserving. And there is what Paul the Apostle did. He saw that the truth of the gospel was being turned upside down. He saw that the truth of the gospel was being eroded into. And he wanted and he had to defend the gospel the truth of the gospel why do we have to preserve the truth of the gospel because if the gospel is changed 
a mutilated gospel cannot save if the gospel is changed a modified gospel cannot save if the gospel is changed a watered down gospel cannot save that's the reason why because paul the apostle was interested in the salvation of people both jews and gentiles so he had to defend the truth of the gospel preserve the truth of the gospel so that this gospel will remain as god has given us and it remains as god has given us then people will hear the gospel the true gospel the perfect gospel the heavenly gospel the saving gospel the transforming gospel and the gospel that changes not and so those who hear will be able to respond to that gospel they'll give their lives to the lord and they will be saved as it was then so it should be today that every one of us ministers every one of us preachers every one of us leaders every one of us soul winners should preserve the truth of the gospel at all costs preserving the truth of the gospel at all costs there are three things we're looking at today in the message number one the danger of pillars shifting from the foundation that's what happened to peter it was a pillar in the kingdom a pillar in the church a pillar in the new testament and now the pillar was shifting from the foundation and that's very dangerous and the same thing with us today any preacher well-known preacher any preacher a preacher that is known all over the world or maybe all over our nation maybe all over our state maybe in our church if it sheets from the foundation that's very dangerous because many will backslide and many will lose their faith and their hope in the lord the danger of pillars shifting from the foundation number two the dissembling of partners shaking by fear after peter um, kind of dissembled and he went he left the place where he was before when those jews came from james Barnabas and others they also dissembled with him and they said if peter is afraid of those people coming from jerusalem who am i and so we have the dissembling of partners shaken by fear fear of man is very very dangerous the fear of man will bring a snare the fear of a man a woman high people great people forceful people the fear of their face and the fear of their comment what will they say what will they do how will they react how will they respond that fear the fear of anyone in our lives will bring us near and lead us astray and not only lead us astray a leader's sin it's a leading sin it will lead other people astray to the dissembling of partners shaking by fear number three the defense by paul steadfast in the faith the defense by paul paul the apostle thank god we have a person like paul the apostle that when everybody was going the other direction he could stand alone and he could stand for the truth thank god today you can be a man like that because if everybody fell or stand if everybody compromised who will be conqueror if everybody went astray who will stand on the truth of the word of god it's good for you in the time of the old testament there was a daniel a daniel that was stand alone and then his three companions and friends go follow him in the time of the new testament we have this man paul the apostle and he could stand and because he stood the word is now preserved for us i pray the lord will make a paul out of you and make you stand whatever is happening around you in jesus name 
the defense by Paul steadfast in the faith let's come to number one number one we have the danger of pillars shifting from the foundation three things we're looking at here number one the immutability of the saving pillar of truth there's the pillar of truth apart from a human being apart from a preacher apart from an apostle being a pillar the pillar of truth that's the pillar on which we build the temple of truth and we build everything we want to build because the temple of truth the truth of the gospel must stand on a pillar the immutability of the saving pillar of truth number two the instability of some pillars in the temple the temple is the church the temple is the whole thing that we have under the saving grace of God and there are some of the pillars there some of the preachers there some of the pastors there some of the people there that were shaking they were unstable unstable as water thou shalt not excel the instability of some pillars in the temple number three the importance of steadfast perseverance without timidity the importance of holding on and standing fast and remaining solid unshakable steadfast perseverance without timidity let's look at number one is the immutability of the saving pillar of truth we're told in first timothy chapter 3 verse 15 first timothy chapter 3 reading from verse 15 but if i tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of god which is the church of the living god the pillar and ground of truth the church of the living god the pillar and the ground of truth if the church is anything at all the church should be holding forth and holding out the truth of the gospel and the church then becomes the depository becomes the place where you deposit the truth the whole truth and if you're looking for the truth you come to the church and the church is the pillar of truth and is the ground of truth and those who are preachers then in the church must stand like pillars and stand for the truth of the word of god in G jeremiah chapter 1 reading from verse 9 jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9 then the lord put forth a sand and he touched my mouth and the lord said unto me behold i have put my words in thy mouth i have put my words in thy mouth i have put the perfect word i have put the fullness of the word i put the complete revelation in your mouth i have put my words in thy mouth what did that make jeremiah having the truth loving the truth possessing the truth preaching the truth announcing the truth putting forth the truth of the word of god look at verse 18 in verse 18 for behold i have made thee this day a different city and an iron pillar without the truth without the gospel jeremiah could not be a pillar without the truth without the revelation Peter could not be a pillar. What makes anyone a dependable pillar? What makes anyone a standing pillar? What makes anyone a pillar to be reckoned with in the church of the living God is that he has the truth, the true gospel, 
the word of God, the gospel, and he retains and he holds on to that truth. And the Lord said, For behold, I have made thee this day a defense city and an iron pillar and brazen walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, and against the people of the land. Let's come to First Corinthians chapter 3, reading from verse 10. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder i have laid the foundation and another builders thereon but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon look at verse 11 in verse 11 it tells us for all the foundation can no man lead and that is laid which is Christ Jesus is that foundation in Christ Christ as Savior Christ alone without circumcision Christ a sanctifier Christ alone without the ceremony of the Old Testament Christ the baptizer in the Holy Ghost Christ alone without drinking from river Jordan Christ the healer Christ alone without all the herbs and everything Christ the Redeemer Christ the Redeemer without other people becoming a co-redemptor or Redeemer with him Christ other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And then we're told in 2 Timothy chapter 2, reading from verse 19. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity depart from corruption depart from corrupting the word of God and depart from corrupting their own lives the immutability of the saving pillar of truth let's come to number two now number two the instability of some pillars in the temple the instability of some pillars in the temple. We're coming to Galatians chapter 2, reading from verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I was to him to the face because he was to be blamed. That wasn't expected of Peter. The same thing with us, any of us who are pastors, who are preachers, who are overseers, who are leaders, who are workers, and who have been taught the truth. The Lord expects that we'll stand by the truth, stand for the truth, stand for the truth, and present the truth at every opportunity to everyone we come across. But as it was in the Old Testament, it also spilled over to the New Testament. You remember Ophni and Phinehas? They derailed. You remember Nadab and Abihu? They derailed. You remember Aaron? He didn't stand on the word, and the people were led into idolatry. You remember many people that have gone away from the truth of the word, and now we come to the New Testament. And Peter himself, writing his epistle, second epistle of Peter, chapter 2, he said, There were false prophets in those days, and there shall be false teachers among you. Unfortunately, Peter himself fell into that kind of situation. It was a situation of compromise. 
a situation of not being strong, a situation of fearing man more than the Messiah, and fearing the people around him more than the Lord God of heaven. Now, to point accusing finger to Peter is one thing, and for you to understand in your own moment of confrontation, in your own moment of uh, when people come uh, that you respect and you honor, and then you have a stand to take, and you have the words to defend, for you to be able to stand, it will take really a good experience of salvation. A good experience of sanctification, a good experience of baptism and power and courage and boldness in the Holy Ghost. But now we're told about Peter that he was to be blamed. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, for before that certain came from James, that's James in Jerusalem, he did eat of the Gentiles. He did each of the Gentiles. No big deal. Already, when God called Peter to the house of Cornelius, already he was there, and he spent some days of them. He slept in the house they provided, Gentiles. He ate the food they provided, and they knew already that the Lord had broken down that middle wall of partition. They knew already that Peter went to the house of Cornelius and he ate there. They even challenged him. Look at Acts chapter 11, reading from verse 2. Acts chapter 11. We're reading from verse 2. It says there, And when Peter was come unto Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him. What a pity. They contended about a non essential. They contended about eating food. They contended about what goes in and then will you pass it out. And Jesus had told them before he left, he said, It is not what enters into the man, like food, like drink, that corrupts the man, defiles the man. It is what comes out of the man. Now they challenged him, they said, Peter, well, what have you done? You've gone to the uncircumcised Gentiles and you have eaten with them. Look at verse 3. In verse 3 it says, saying, Thou wentest in to men uncircumcised and did eat with them. In verse 4. Verse 4 tells us what Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them look at verse 8 in verse 8 but i said not so lord for nothing come on unclean as at any time entered into my mouth verse 9 and then it says in verse 9 but the voice answered me again from heaven that should have settled it once and forever the voice answered me again from heaven what god has cleansed that call not thou come on then in verse 10 in verse 10 and this was done three times and all were drawn up again into heaven and then in verse 11 it says in verse 11 and behold, immediately there were three men already come unto the house where I was sent from Caesarea unto me. Verse 12, verse 12 says, And the Spirit bid me go. And the Spirit bid me go. That's the Holy Spirit above James above John, above any of the people from Judah or Jerusalem. That's the Holy Spirit high above any man on earth. And that should have settled it for Peter. And the Spirit made me go with them, nothing doubting. 
Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. But now, look at what Peter has done. We must look at our personal lives. And if we have this crippling fear of man, this terrorizing fear of man, this intimidating fear of man, and we put our lives into the hands of a man, of a woman, and we know the truth, the truth of salvation, and the truth of righteousness, and the truth of restitution, and the truth of sanctification, and the truth of purity of heart, and the truth of abiding in the word of God without adding, without subtracting. If we know the truth that this is what to preach, and this is what to lay by, and then the fear of man will not allow us to do what the Lord has revealed we should do we might eventually miss heaven. For whosoever shall be ashamed of me in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man shall be ashamed of him in the kingdom of God before his heavenly Father. I pray will be steadfast. I said I pray will be steadfast. I'll wait for your amen. You know, Peter could have then looked at Paul, and Peter could have said, Paul, I've been there before you came. I knew Christ in the physical. All the time you were persecuting the church, I was already an apostle. And you say that against me. Peter could have found a way to fight back. And Peter could have found a way to tell the old, old story of what Paul used to be. You make me come to shame publicly. Then you could have dug into the history of Paul and you could have brought something new you to you too. You too. Look at what you were. Those are the people that don't like correction, they're incorrigible. And so when you say anything that will correct them openly, because Paul the Apostle did it openly, they have the tendency of saying we can dig out something too and throw that into the public and throw that into the social media so that he too will face the ship. What was the attitude of Peter? Look at Second Peter chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 14. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 14. Wherefore, beloved, here is Peter writing, seeing that she look for such things, be diligent that she may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Peter was saying, Have you heard about what I did? Have you heard about my compromise? Have you heard about my discipline? Don't follow that. Make sure because Christ is coming, I have been corrected and I'm taking the correction. Make sure that you are found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. Look at verse 15. It says, and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation even as our beloved brother paul look at peter instead of fighting back instead of throwing mud at him or stone at him instead of using his position using his experience and using his opportunity to also write an epistle instead of using that to throw that at him he said even as our beloved brother paul also according to the wisdom that is given unto him as written unto you. He said that Paul is a man of wisdom. That Paul is a man without compromise. That Paul is a man that loves the truth and believes the truth above even me. Look at that. Can you do that? If something had happened 
that you were rebuilt probably directly probably indirectly and you then said how could he say that why didn't he call me to the into the private place and then tell me in such a nice way in such a good way how could he do that and just throw it out like that before everybody can you do like peter and say he has wisdom he has understanding he has revelation and he's a beloved brother paul look at verse 16 it says as also in all his epistles he says all the epistles that Paul has written, he wrote in the wisdom of God. He says you may come across the, gospel, the, the word he wrote, the epistle to the Galatians. He even confronted me there, but in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood which day that are on learned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures understand the language his epistles the other scriptures he affirmed that the epistles of paul were part of scripture he didn't say no i'll not affirm him I will not confirm him. I will not honor him. I will not give any public honor unto him and say he wrote in wisdom, he wrote in good revelation, and he wrote the scripture. No, I will not do that because look at what he did to me. There are people who say they are Christians. There are people who say they are sanctified. And something that had happened seven years ago ten years ago the preacher the pastor was preaching and he pointed at them and he said hey church we must correct this that is not right and then singled out and said brother so-and-so sister so-and-so what he has done we will not allow it here this is the pillar of truth and the church of the living God. It happened 10 years ago and that is still in the mind. That is still in the heart. Where is the sanctification we talk about, we sing about, we preach about, we pray about and we tell other people if we're sanctified, thank God for somebody who is able to correct us. Somebody who is able to rise up and say that is not right now peter had a good attitude that's the evidence that a person is a real child of god is a real minister of god it says they rest the scriptures unto their own destruction now in verse 17 verse 17 says ye therefore beloved seen ye know these things before beware lest ye also be led away with the arrow of the wicked and fall from your own steadfastness. He said, whatever you see I've done and I wasn't steadfast, you stand straight and you stand firm and you hold firm and you hold on and make sure that you are steadfast every moment until the very end. The Lord grant us grace. The Lord grant us power. And the God, Lord, grant us the fortitude to stand firm in everything, every day, to the end of our lives, in Jesus' name. We're coming to number three here. Number three, the importance of steadfast perseverance without timidity. The importance of steadfast perseverance without timidity we're coming to second samuel chapter 12 reading from verse 1 second samuel chapter 12 verse 1 and the lord sent nathan unto david and he came unto him and said unto him there were two men in one city the one rich and the other poor verse 2 in verse 2 the rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds verse 3 verse 3 says but the poor man had nothing except one 
little ewe lamb which he had bought and nourished up and it grew together with him and with his children he did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter in verse 4 it says in verse 4 and there came a traveler unto the rich man and his pitch to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress it to prepare it for the wayfaring man that was come unto him but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it prepared it for the man that was come to him then in verse 5 and David's anger was greatly kindled against the man and he said to Nathan as the Lord liveth the man that has done this thing shall surely die look at verse 6 and he said and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity verse 7 verse 7 says and Nathan said to David thou art the man you know the story but can you be that bold can you confront a David a leader can you confront somebody who is supposed to live a righteous life who is supposed to lead the people but is committed adultery and has even killed the man the husband of that woman and he has taken that woman to himself to urge to his many wives can you discipline such a person can you talk to such a person can you confront such a person can you speak to such a person or are you just will you be gossiping talking under your voice and putting everything under the carpet and when he calls you you say say yes sir yes sir you have it in your heart you have it in your mind is the one polluting the gospel is the one corrupting the gospel is the one mutilating the gospel is the one destroying the church and destroying the truth in the church and yet yes sir yes sir yes sir you do not have the backbone of nathan you do not have the backbone of paul to say this is not right thou art the man uh, that is why we're studying the scriptures we're studying the scriptures so that when the time comes for us to stand straight and to stand firm and to correct what needs to be corrected we'll be able to do that not that we are waiting and then the pastor now comes and boldly he says, we won't have that in our church, we won't have that in the kingdom, we won't have that in the ministry. And then uh, instead of correcting and instead of shaping up and still honoring the man that can speak the truth and speak the truth to everyone, no matter who, instead of respecting the man, uh, then we join the people who are unhappy with the man and they are saying, oh, is he talking like that? They say, one deeper like to go back to 1973, 77. As we not change, look at where we are now. And we now know not more than, more Modern. your Bible has become modern your Bible remain the way it ought to remain in Jesus name I said you remain in Jesus name you will abide in the truth you will not run away from the truth you will not escape the truth you will not get up and say if that is the truth of salvation if that is the truth of righteousness then i pick my bag i'm going where are you going if you go away from the truth you go to hell but 
your stand and you say that is the truth and I, I believe that because this church is standing on the truth I will abide in the truth in Jesus name look at it all these many years I got converted 1964 and 1964 to 2022 that's a long time by the grace of God I stand on the whole Bible anybody joining me anybody affirming the truth anybody that will stand and have a backbone that when somebody does something wrong in your presence you have the boldness you have the courage to say no peter no david that should not be the lord will give you backbone to do that in jesus name we're now coming to number a uh, number that's point number two now point number two the dissembling dissembling of uh, partners shaking by fear in galatians chapter 2 reading from verse 13 and the other jews dissembled likewise with him that is with peter in so much that barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation three things here the disastrous example of feebleness in ministers when a minister like peter what we have read when he's feeble when he's weak when he doesn't have backbone when he's like jellyfish when he's not dependable and then he's wobbling how disastrous is that number two the disabling effect of fear of man disabling just tunes you up just makes you totally weak and disables you from doing what you ought to do and from saying what you ought to say number three the damning emulation and feeding on misinterpretations let's look at number one here the disastrous example of feebleness in ministers we've read galatians already let's see now in first corinthians chapter 5 we're looking at verse 6 first corinthians chapter 5 verse 6 your glory in is not good what it means by that is when you saw evil they didn't confront evil they were saying that is our wisdom quietness that is our wisdom glossing over matters that is our wisdom not confronting evil not confronting backsliding that is our wisdom seeing people going astray and defiling the church of the living god and they keep quiet they said that is the glory of our wisdom there are people that think that wisdom is not telling the truth wisdom is avoiding the truth wisdom is not confronting error wisdom is not speaking when we ought to speak out your glory is not good know ye not that a little leaven liveness the whole lump a little leaven liveness the whole lump a little compromise a literal kind of giving in to the weakness of the flesh i won't talk because if i talk they will understand that can corrupt the whole congregation look at verse 11. in verse 11 it tells us but now i have reached unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator and you know or covetous and you know it or an idolater and you know it or a railer and you know it or a drunkard or an extortioner well such and one know not to eat if you know anyone that is called a brother a sister a member of the church 
and he's doing something in the office that is already open in the office there and they know that that person that office this is the way he's doing and he says he's a deep alive member if you know anyone standing on the pulpit and preaching to you in our church and yet he's living a kind of a corrupted life a sinful life a backsliding life you know it and you are just well i won't talk about it who am i to talk about it who am i myself am i in heaven yet if that is his weakness don't i have my weakness then you are you're defending, you're covering up a backslider and a little leaven, lightness, the whole lump. He wants to, to speak out, not to destroy them, to help them, to correct them so that they'll come out of their sin, come out of darkness, and come out of right, and come to righteousness and to the light in Jesus' name. Did I hear any amen now? In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, reading from verse 33. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, reading from verse 33. It says, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. And then in verse 34, it says, Awake to righteousness and sin not. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. We're looking at uh, Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8 cried Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Whatever Jesus condemned in his lifetime, he still condemns today. Whatever Jesus upheld in his lifetime, he still opposed today. Whatever Jesus preached, the righteousness that accepts your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of scribes and the Pharisees shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. The message of Christ is still the same. The commandment of Christ is still the same. The expectation of Christ is still the same. The truth in Christ is still the same. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Look at verse 9. In verse 9 it says, Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with means, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Look at number two here. Number two, the disabling effect of, of the fear of man. If you have the fear of man, it disables you. It's like it switches you off. You are plugged to the socket and because of that there is power, electricity and it's able to turn your fan, it's able to cool your fridge, it's able to make uh, your cooker hot but now you disable the connection. When you disable the connection nothing works, no power, no strength, no fire, no coolness no righteousness nothing prayer will not work preaching will not work all that we're doing will not scratch any surface because the fear of man has disabled us fear will vanish away by the way what are we afraid of pharaoh look at his age how can we be afraid of him Nebuchadnezzar, what are we afraid of? Look at the end, what are you afraid of him? Belshazzar, of all people, the drunken man, the idolatrous man, what are we afraid of? What's the end of him? Lion's den, what are we afraid of? Daniel went there and he came out. You go in there, you'll come out in Jesus' name. Nebuchadnezzar's furnace, what are we afraid of? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they went in and they came out. You will come out. And all the Pharisees and all the Sadducees, everything they did and everything they threatened, what's the outcome? Where are they today? What are you afraid of? We will not be afraid of man anymore. Amen. Amen. 
discipline effect of the fear of man look at first samuel chapter 15 in first samuel chapter 15 i'm reading from verse 22 and samuel said at the lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the lord behold to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams look at verse 23 there and for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. He, the Lord too, has also rejected thee from being king. That's so. Look at verse 24. In verse 24, and so said unto Samuel, I have sinned. For I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people. Because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. When you were saved, what was your passion? What was your pursuit? What was your purpose of heart? when you were saved what drove you to your knees for sanctification how did you pray how did you consecrate your life at sanctification and when you came out of that altar being sanctified how did you feel in your heart and the first problem and the first challenge that confronted you when you were sanctified you remember how bold you were you remember how um, kind of standing steadfast you were what changed you what turned you around what made you so fearful were you fidgeted and why are you going through life now under fear if you want to do anything now you look here you look there it's so and so there it's so and so there what's the matter have you forgotten the price christ paid for you for you to get saved and then he sends you on an errand and he says this is what you do and you never think about Christ anymore, about the Holy Ghost anymore, about the Word of God anymore, about the power of the Holy Ghost anymore. And all you are thinking about now, that man, that woman, what will he say? What will she say? Will she frown? Will he frown? Will he accept or will he reject? Fear of man. And then Sola to say, I have sinned. For I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord, and thy was because I feared now. It's unreasonable fear. So, the people, what could they do? The people, could they tell me, dethrone you from being a king? No, they could not. Could they replace him? No, they could not. Will they fight him instead of fighting the Philistines? No, they will not. Even if they ran away from you and left you there, a little boy, one David, destroyed the Philistines. And you, you are higher and taller and greater than David. What's your problem? Our fears are unreasonable. Our fretting unreasonable our fidgeting unreasonable what could they take away from you they can't take your salvation they can't take your hope of heaven they can't take your joy they can't take the truth away from you what are we afraid of he said because i fear the people and obey their voice that fear is cancelled in jesus name i will not fear i said i will not fear you're not fear in Jesus' name. 
and when that fear is cancelled and you live in the word of God by the word of God in the fullness of the revelation of the word of God the Lord will promote you we're coming to number three here number three the damning emulation and feeding of misinterpretation emulation emulation that word emulation we see other people because peter dissembled barnabas also followed and many other people too they followed emulation looking at people not looking at the word of god looking at people not looking unto jesus the author and the finisher of our faith looking at people what they will say what they will do and what will happen looking at people and not looking unto christ alone look unto me all ye the ends of the earth and be ye saved and be ye healed and be ye delivered all the ends of the earth we look unto the lord alone all the time and even when you see the people you make nothing of that because christ has not become all in all in your life i say christ has become all in all in your life amen and because of that every threatening situation will come under your feet every threatening man or woman will come under your feet and you will stand like a real soldier of the cross ought to stand we're not feeble civilians we are strong and powerful soldiers of christ in jesus name can you think of a soldier running back from the battlefield and then you confront him how did you run from the battlefield i saw a child by the way and that child was doing like this to me you're a soldier you're going to the battlefield and one child is doing like this to you that's why you run. go back there and go and face that challenge you will win the battle we're looking at the word of God and we're looking at Galatians chapter 5 from verse 19. It says in verse 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Look at verse 20 and then in verse 20, it tells us idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, emulations. You don't commit fornication, but you have emulation you don't commit adultery but you have emulation you don't you are not a witch but you have emulations and you don't have hatred but you have emulation you don't have wrath but you have emulation you don't have strife you don't have sedition heresies your only problem is you cannot stand alone you cannot stand firm you cannot stand without looking at somebody and emulating them and copying them that's the challenge and it makes you to be grouped with the idolaters and adulterers and fornicators and the witches and all the sorcerers and everybody and then it says in verse 21 in verse 21 it tells us envies murders drunkenness rebellions and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things, emulation included, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. They which do such things, emulations, they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. I think it's better for everyone to get back our backbone, our strength our courage our boldness and not be cringing and crawling and you know whatever and then we're so timid and so fearful because of what anybody will do emulations copying the people that go astray that backslide for any reason it will make us eventually lose and miss the kingdom of god because the fearful the abominable and the sorcerers and all liars shall have their part in the lake that burneth with brimstone and with fire. I pray that will not be your Lord. That will not be my Lord. 
I will stand. I said I will stand. You will stand in Jesus' name. Now we're coming to we're coming to point number three. Point number three: the defense by Paul, steadfast in the faith. Look at it again. We're looking at Galatians chapter two, verse eleven. Galatians chapter two, verse eleven. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face. That's Paul the apostle. I pray the same grace every one of us will have and the same boldness every one of us will have and the same steadfastness every one of us will have in Jesus name he said I withstood him to the face you know sometimes if someone is older than you are who is higher than you are if somebody who is uh, more respected than you are who has been there long time before you came in if he's doing something corrupting the gospel if he's doing something showing a bad example and then you remember what we have learned and you remember the courage we ought to have the steadfastness we ought to have and with all due respect, you see respect to him, but my brother, what you are doing is leading us astray. And actually, we've been under this kind of compulsion for a long time. But I decided today to help you and to help myself and to help the church that this is not expected of you every time we're here the word of god you have the tendency of laughing it off and watering it down and discouraging us and bringing us back to square one and then somebody will come to you and say do you know who you are talking to yes i'm talking to one of our leaders i'm talking to somebody who should lift us up but is bringing us down they will not allow you to tell the truth or to confront the one that is going astray not only that sometimes it's not even somebody up there is maybe your own child you're bringing your child to the church and you taught him salvation the word of god that this is the way to go and you see that somebody is leading that child astray and is telling that child are you going to follow your father even when you grow up are you going to continue in the church with your father and you heard about it and then you go to that person to confront the person why is it you are destroying my child I'm bringing him up in the way of the Lord. I'm spending everything I've got to help him to be educated and also to make heaven. Why are you doing like this to my child? And you are telling my child not to continue with me in the church. You know, people don't expect you to confront the people. They're destroying your child. They're destroying your family. They're destroying everything you care for. They don't expect you to talk. They expect you to keep quiet. See your family going down the drain. Keep quiet. And see them derailing your children. And keep quiet. And see them mutilating and destroying the truth of the gospel and they expect you to keep quiet enough is enough if anybody wants to take your child to hell and you keep quiet maybe you are not saved yourself maybe you don't know the value of salvation but if you understand that this is the way of truth and all my family will follow me and all my converts will follow me and i will not allow anyone whatever their power whatever the understanding to silence me i'll take all these converts to heaven the grace of god will help you and so he said i are alone standing alone you will stand alone i will shoot him to the face because he was to be blamed look at 
look at it there in verse 14 and he said and when i saw that they walk not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel i said unto peter before them all paul did the right thing and all scripture is given by inspiration and it is good for doctrine and it is profitable before them all they want us to follow psychology psychology says man has self-esteem and if there's anything man wants to guard and protect he wants to guard his self-esteem so if you're going to correct anything at all don't correct publicly don't say it in the presence of other people find a time when peter and yourself will be private together and then you say then don't don't tell him don't confront people don't have this you know honestly contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints they say we shouldn't do it like that we should say um dearly beloved apostle peter do you think that that thing that happened in antioch is the right thing when those people came from james don't you think that may mislead some young people and they say we should discuss it they say we shouldn't tell them directly the bible says no everything we read in the bible says no we don't call them to dialogue and we don't say it in the private he said i said unto peter before them all if thou being a jew leavest after the manner of gentiles and not as do you the, Gen uh, the jews why compelest thou the gentiles to live as do the jews i pray that this duty the lord will give us the grace to perform the duty in jesus name number one the duty of declaring the gospel of christ the duty of declaring the gospel of christ number two the demand of defending the gospel against corruption number three the decree of delivering the gospel to every creature let's look at number one there number one we're looking at the duty of declaring the gospel of Christ. We're looking at Acts of the Apostle chapter 20 and we're reading from verse 24. Acts chapter 20 verse 24, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish the course with joy. I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I've received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God you will finish with joy we will finish with joy and when the Lord comes and he comes to take away the saints we will remain saints will not have gone back to be sinners in Jesus name look at verse 25 in verse 25 but now behold I know I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more look at verse 26 wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men verse 27 for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God I have not been negligent to declare unto you all the counsel of God as the counsel of God has been declared unto you boldly and courageously you too will take it up and everywhere you go you will declare it boldly and courageously in jesus name 
verse 28 in verse 28 take it therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the holy ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of god which he has purchased with his own blood we're coming to number two there number two is the demand of defending the gospel against corruption the demand of defending the gospel against corruption galatians chapter 2 we're looking at verse 4 galatians chapter 2 verse 4 and that because of false brethren unstable brethren wavering brethren corrupted brethren unawares brought in who came in privily to spy out our liberty which we have in christ jesus that they might bring us into bondage they wanted to bring the converts of paul the apostle to the bondage of the mosaic law to the bondage of circumcision to the bondage of their ceremonial law and to the bondage of the jewish religion he said they came to spy out our liberty that now we're saved without circumcision we're born again without animal sacrifice and we follow the lord the way of the lord and christ is our perfect example and we follow him all the way through they came to spy out our liberty look at verse 5 verse 5 says to whom we give place by subjection no not for an hour they did a lot of things to confuse us, to compel us, to grind us, to push us, to draw us, to bribe us, to do everything that they might bring us to false doctrine that everything was stood for in the word of the Lord that we might change. They did it by frowning. We said no. Then they turned, they did it by smiling. We said no. They did it by pushing us. We said no. They did it by pulling us. We said no. They did it by, you know, giving us things and being nice to us. We said no. All these things that you give us will not equal the salvation of the Lord. And they did it by withdrawing something from us. They did it in every way, but we said whatever they do, whatever they say, wherever they go, to whom we gave a place by subjection. No, not for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. The truth will continue with you. The gospel will continue with you. Sound doctrine will continue with you in Jesus' name. Jude, we're looking at chapter 1, verse 3. Jude 1, 3. Beloved, when I give all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, that means salvation common to the Jews and common to the Gentiles. Salvation common to the first century and to this century. Salvation common to the white and to the black. Salvation, the same salvation that Paul the Apostle had is the same salvation we have. Common salvation. It was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that ye should, ye must, you have to, earnestly content we don't sleepishly content we don't sluggishly content we don't haphazardly content and we don't superficially content and we don't shallowly content we earnestly passionately with all our heart with all our strength with all the skill we have earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints i will i said i will 
you know if you've tasted the gospel and if you know the gospel is coming from christ at calvary if you know that is the most precious thing you have how will you contend for that if somebody came to take your child away and, and you have the strength and you are there and they want to take your child away to the land of nowhere are you going to just be looking at them and say don't do that don't take that child away that's my child that's the only child i have and then they're bold are you going to be like that ah you'll be like that honestly i said honestly you know somebody came to your house and he said I'm asking for Mrs. So-and-so. I say, what's the matter? That's my wife. Said, where is she? What do you want her for? And then she started like going everywhere. And then she grabbed her and said, why are you staying with this man? Come with me. Well, this man, say bye-bye to him. Are you going to be saying, man, what's the matter now? Why are you taking my wife away? What have I done? What do you want? Shut up! Taking the woman away. Are you going to just stay like that? I'm asking you. Uh -huh. You're honestly content for it. You say, ah, this one. You, if, you take, if you want to take my life, take my life. This one will not go with you. Am I talking about you? And now the gospel. Now we're talking about the eternal truth of the gospel. The truth that saves. And the truth that sanctifies. And the truth that will lead people to heaven. And somebody wants to take that away from you. Away from us. And all of us here were so gentle. Were so nice. Were so spineless. And then we'll say, why are you doing that? You are corrupting the gospel. You are taking the gospel away. How is it now? This is what we have been laboring for, for all these many years. Uh-uh. Don't do that. Earnestly, passionately, courageously, wholeheartedly, with everything you've got, earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. I will. I will look at number three there. Number three there is the decree of delivering the gospel to every creature. What we have is a decree. What we have is the word of God. And we deliver to every creature without fear, without favor, without fear, without favor. It tells us in Mark chapter 15, chapter 16, verse 15, and he Christ and he the savior and he the redeemer and he the resurrected Christ and he said unto them go ye into all the world and preach the gospel don't leave the gospel back at home when you're going out don't leave the gospel in a chest in a in a cover in the deposit box when you're going out take the gospel the whole gospel with the power and with the pungency that is in the gospel from the early church until this time take that gospel with you everywhere you go and preach the gospel to every creature amen, amen. when you meet them high they are preach to them lord they are preach to them men they are preach to them women they are preach to them the same gospel go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature say lord say lord i will in your strength in your power by your grace everywhere anywhere to everyone i will preach the gospel 
rise up and tell the Lord, I will, I will, I will. I will preach the gospel to every creature I come across. No fear of man, no fidgeting, no fretting, no fear, nothing that will stop you or muscle your mouth. I will tell the Lord.